Greetings, everyone. I want to thank Steve LePage, your membership chair, for having me here, and Pope and Young for having me here. Uh, these the, we are this group here. It's listed as the I would say the de facto board of the Hunt Quietly movement. There, we've had a lot of help over the last years with various components of what we're trying to do. But these are the folks that are that are helping on a fairly consistent basis. Um, it takes a lot of open-mindedness for a group uh, like Pope and Young to have me come and speak because I disagree with so much of what Pope and Young does. And the three pillars of Pope and Young are preserve, promote, and protect. Um, the preserve component relates to the keeping of records of the trophy quality of harvested game animals uh, from the website as a justification. The group writes, these vast records have been used by wildlife management or wildlife agencies, state agencies, and other hunting groups to aid in management decisions and establish seasons. Uh, I have a little bit of concern there. I would caution against using these data for those purposes because over time, as hunting has become more competitive and access has tightened up, people are more and more reluctant to have their animals scored and put in the Pope and Young record. Uh, so relying on these data probably gives a skewed perspective on what's happened to trophy big game over time. If it is important to keep records, then I don't see the value in associating the person's name with the record. I think that that perpetuates the kind of um, competitiveness and hoarding of hunting opportunity and that that is degrading hunting in America today. So I, I would much rather know whether or not it was shot someplace I could go that wouldn't cost me 15 grand. That seems like a much more important data point to me. Um, plus, when many of these animals are killed by the use of an outfitter in which the hunter like did nothing more than execute the shot, which is about 5% of what makes a successful hunt, 90% is scouting. So like the person's name is by and large irrelevant for my purposes. The promote component uh, is, uh, is about hunting rec hunter recruitment, which is something I strongly oppose. Uh, it, 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 it makes the hunting nonprofits the puppet of the hunting industry. Um, it, it, it turns it into the hunting industry gives the nonprofits money. Um, they're not don't it's not donations. It's advertising dollars to try to bring more people in to the, to an already saturated pastime, so that. Uh, the hunting industry can sell people that have no gear, lots of stuff. The, con the, the protect component, I, I share the concerns about the future of bow hunting. I just learned that Steve LePage is going to be leaving the talk early today to go uh, testify a about a bill that would allow crossbow hunting in Montana, which is something I strongly, I, I, I strongly oppose and I applaud you. That seems like a good use of time. Um, much of the advocacy on the protect end with Pope and Young has to do with threats from anti-hunters. I would argue the biggest threat is self-imposed. It's us putting dead and dying wildlife on, the, on social media and, and websites where everybody can see it. And there's no value to that in my mind. And, and Pope and Young and all the nonprofits do that in spades. So I think they're shooting themselves in the foot. What I, the way I've been characterizing the Hunt Quietly movement is, is an information campaign that encourages hunters to spend their money and time in ways that align with their values. What we value, we value publicly accessible DIY hunting as opposed to paying for access, tag auctions, landowner outfitter tags. You'll hear me like summarize that probably throughout as what I call privatization. Ever since I was a wee little kid, hunting has always been to me getting something by your wits, yourself, that you can eat. And uh, everything in the hunting sphere is pushing us away from that and towards this bottom line. 
There's a historic, there's historical pr precedence for being concerned about this type of hunting. Writing in the Journal of Forestry in 1919, the great naturalist Aldo Leopold writes, they, and he's talking about a particular breed of hunting that, hunter that includes me, hunt national forests for other reasons than merely inability to own a private shooting preserve or pay dues in an exclusive club. Regardless of the cost, there is an ingrained repugnance in the heart of many sportsmen to having their sport served to them in a spoon. There is a certain rugged independence which eschews bought in sport. More with the historical precedence we have, U.S. public trust doctrine. In a review of the North American model of wildlife conservation, but the, uh, the Wildlife Society and Boone and Crockett Club write, fundamental to public trust doctrine is the notion that the public should have opportunity to access natural resources for purposes that traditionally include fishing, hunting, and trapping. Then we factor in that the game belongs to the state, and I think a very relevant fact is that much of the game in this country is on farm and ranch land, and 10 to 50% of farm and ranch income in recent years has come from the taxpayer, that being us. I think that's a relevant fact. And I conclude from that, that governments and the hunting industry and everybody else should be working toward providing hunting access. But that's not what, what's happening. Instead, the hunting industry creates highly competitive markets for access to game and then tries to sell it to us. And the politicians have caught wind of this and they're capitalizing on this market. Um, witness the elk wars that are going on throughout the West. And what they do, what the politicians now do, is they try to ensure that their wealthy, large landowner constituents get as many of the tags as possible so that those folks can then sell them off or use them themselves. Who we care about? We care for people that hunt solely for meat, hide, horns, and personal enjoyment, as opposed to people that hunt partly or wholly to draw attention to themselves and make money on social media and hunting TV. I would argue that anybody that's showing strangers what they shoot on social media and TV either is making money, getting free gear, or wishes they were. And there's historical precedents to be concerned about that. George Bird Grinnell, the famous anthropologist and naturalist, co-founder of the Boone and Crockett Club with Theodore Roosevelt wrote in his Code of a Sportsman, a sportsman derives no financial profit from game killed. And then of course we have the North American model which says that wildlife cannot be slaughtered for commercial use. The core reality is that the quality and the quantity of publicly accessible hunting are in free fall in this country. If you follow hunting media, you could be excused from thinking the biggest problems in hunting today are something like insufficient and outdated uh, how-to content and technology for killing game in the modern era, or that hunters lack the clothing necessary to keep them warm and dry. But I think that those things pale in comparison to what we call the big three. Reduced opportunity, reduced access from working lands being leased and sold as hunting properties, and increased crowding. And now I'm going to make the case that those are the dominant issues facing hunters in America today. So this is what has happened to averaged over units, what's happened to deer, elk, and pronghorn draw odds for non-residents in four western states since 2011. We're looking at the black line here. The applicants per tag was something like two, down around two as recently as 2017, and now it's up close to four. So whereas you used to be able to draw every two years, it's down to every four on average now. And what the yellow line represents 
is Google searches for the hunting shows, Fresh Tracks, Meat Eater, Hushin, and Born and Raised Outdoors. And I don't know if anything, uh, anybody here knows anything about statistics, but the, air, the R square in that relationship is about 0.9. Um, I believe firmly that this is causative. Uh, so, why, so why some people walk around with cameras behind them, other people are, uh, actually like to hunt. And the people that actually like to hunt are getting their opportunity robbed from them by people that are trying to make money and get famous. This is what's happened to opportunity in just the last two years, as near as I can tell through a quick Google search. Reductions in the numbers of tags, things going from over-the-counter to draw. Uh, reduced opportunity is the norm throughout the country. Much of this is due to increased interest, which I would argue is a function of hunting promotion, which is something I oppose. There's not good data on leasing in the U.S., uh, but I get emails like these from all over the country, leasing and the buying of hunting lands and what that's doing to the traditional grassroots hunting communities opportunity through time, everywhere from the Black Hills to Tennessee to Mississippi, Alabama, California, Louisiana, New Jersey, Kansas, Wisconsin. This is just a sample of the emails I get discussing purchase of hunting opportunity and what's that, what that's doing for access. It's making it so that small numbers of hunters have lots of opportunity for themselves and everybody else is squashed onto some 50 acre wildlife management area somewhere. Or as uh, Anderson writes in the Minnesota Star Tribune earlier this year, competition for access to waterfowl hunting in North America has increased over time, resulting in, in the leasing and purchase of hunting land by hunters and commercial outfitters. This is an article that's explaining how in Manitoba, a place that a lot of waterfowl hunters used to like to go from the US, now it's gone from over the counter to a draw. And even if you're successful in the draw, you're only allowed to hunt seven days. So thanks a lot, Duck Dynasty. Thanks a lot, DU, for all the hunter recruitment. Here's one solid data point. This is Andrew McKean writing in Outdoor Life. He says, the number of the millions of acres leased to outfitters in Montana was around 7,000 in 2012. Now, and then by 2016, it's approaching 19 million, and that's one third of the state's private land. I, can't on, I can only imagine what's happened from 2016 to present. Leasing is obviously connected to crowding. Uh, or as Tony Peterson writes for Meat Eater earlier this year, the emphasis on growing big bucks ends up with guys leasing as much land as possible. This forces more hunters onto whatever public land is available. There's lots of data on crowding. I just picked this piece of data because I think it's funny. This, these, this is survey data from the National Shooting Sports Foundation, their practitioner's guide to hunting, recruitment, retention, and reactivation. This is a 500 and two-page tome devoted to getting more people to hunt and fish. And according to their survey data, 82% that indicate crowding is the dominant factor controlling where they hunt, and 55% report abandoning a hunting location in the last five years due to crowding. So what's the biggest barrier to getting more people out there? There's too many people out there. With recreation planners, wildlife biologists, other academics, the effect of crowding on hunter satisfaction has been a topic of interest for decades. So these are research articles that document the effect of crowding on hunter satisfaction. Spoiler alert, it ain't good. More crowding, less satisfaction. But what I'm trying to draw your attention to here is that the number of these articles has increased dramatically from decade to decade over time to the point where now there was a hundred of these articles published in 2014 to 2023. So the, the recreation planning community, uh, the academics, the biologists are more and more concerned about crowding and hunting. So the underlying causes of, of the big three, of course, habitat loss is a factor over th the last 30 years. We've lost about 4% of federal land habitat and 8% of private land habitat, according to this article in 
frontiers in ecology and the environment. This article is actually focused on habitat for endangered species, but I don't see why it would be much different for game species. It might even be worse because a lot of times game species like white-tailed deer live in proximity to urban centers, whereas game uh, endangered species do not. Not much we can do about that. People need a place to live, but it makes it even more important that we get everything else right, and I don't think we do. The causes we could most easily address in my mind are the hunting nonprofits, the hunting industry, and hunting entertainment. I put those two together because it's often hard to tell where one ends and the other begins. It's also often difficult to tell where the hunting nonprofits end and the hunting industry begins. And then hunting social media. So the hunting nonprofits and the hunting industry, apparently, I would imagine, I mean, this is not my job. I work in another completely unrelated sector. I would imagine that they're aware of what's happened to opportunity. I'm imagining that they know what's happened to leasing. I'm imagining they know how big a problem crowding is. And what's their solution? We need more hunters. It's as if the boat is leaking in the hunting industry, in the hunting nonprofits, their solution is to drill more holes in it. Why is it this way? Well, the hunting industry donates a hell of a lot of money to the nonprofits. And these, like I alluded to earlier, these dollars are not donations. There's a lot of strings attached. These, are, these dollars are advertising dollars. The idea is to bring people into hunting so you can sell people that don't have any gear, that aren't geared up yet, a bunch of stuff. Um, I'd like to add that the vast majority of hunters in this country don't belong to any hunting nonprofit. So there are alternatives here. You could try to engage the existing hunting community. The problem with that is they already are geared up. So here's a couple quotes I used to, amusing to, to support this contention. Um, I had some involvement with backcountry hunters and anglers for a time. Still do a little bit of work with them uh, from time to time. But your quote I heard from a BHA employee in 2019, our corporate sponsors, meaning the hunting industry, wouldn't like it very much if we backed off R3. Uh, and then in, in a, from another employee in 2022, we can't give up on R3 because we fundraise off of it. So I want to clarify what I believe hunting recruitment is and what it is not. If a potential hunter comes to a nonprofit and wants to learn how to hunt, I think we'd be kind of being jerks if we didn't try to help that person. So that's not what I'm talking about when I talk about hunting recruitment. I'm talking about the nonprofits in the industry trying to gin up interest in a, a pastime that's already well over capacity to make people into hunters. And they do this through social media cam campaigns, widely advertised how-to courses, college clubs and collaboration with influencers and celebrities. Uh, I think that probably the worst thing that's happened to publicly accessible hunting in the last 10 years is Joe Rogan. Here's a guy with a huge platform that sits at the nexus of the hunting community and the rest of society and never shuts up about elk hunting. Um, and the hunting industry and the hunting nonprofits love this guy because uh, he's bringing more people in to an already saturated pastime so that they can make more money. And meanwhile, the guy by my lights, does it, what he's doing isn't even hunting. Um, he's going out on wildlife preserves and shooting glorified cattle. So I want to talk about some of the misleading tactics that the hunting industry and the nonprofits use to justify R3. More hunters needed for conservation. Meanwhile, there is zero evidence that R3 has done anything positive for wildlife. The fixation on R3 might actually deter wildlife conservation because if the nonprofits weren't so fixated on R3, they might actually get some conservation work done. We need more hunters to fund conservation, which contradicts the fact that revenue, and I've adjusted these values for inflation, is higher than it's ever been. Uh, I haven't updated these data in a few years, but uh, the funding picture is bright going from 2019 forward, probably more bright because of COVID. 
another thing you'll hear in the we need more hunters for conservation thing. Uh, but another thing you won't hear, I'm sorry, excuse me, is that intense hunting pressure harms is, harms wildlife. And there's a lot of peer reviewed data on this. It messes up spatial distributions and everything of, from ptarmigan to waterfowl. And there are fitness costs associated with this spatial redistribution, or as Madison and Fox, Madison and Fox write in their 1995 review of waterfowl, because hunting disturbance causes underexploitation of potential feeding grounds where population limitation is considered to occur, such disturbance will, by definition, have an impact at the population level. Uh, much of the spatial distribution redistribution in these articles is from public to private land. So in this sense, R3 contributes to wildlife privatization. These are just the articles that I've cited in the last slide to demonstrate I did my homework. There's even more direct evidence, uh, everything from nutrient acquisition in elk, cow to calf ratios in elk, fat storage in ducks, body mass with, with mallards, and like social factors like infanticide rates in brown bears are negatively impacted by intense hunting pressure. So the next time you see some influencer online telling with his bow telling you that he's like Mr. Conservation Guy, I call bullshit. Uh, there's this other narrative that more hunters are needed to protect our rights. Meanwhile, there's zero evidence that R3 has done anything positive for our right to hunt. Uh, I would argue the opposite. I think more hunters is more people, more people putting controversial stuff on computers, which is demonstra demonstratively led to hunting bans. Uh, we can't spear bears anymore in Alberta, thanks to Josh Bomar, for example. Uh, you can't hunt grizzlies in British Columbia anymore because uh, some guys there that had to film themselves shooting a grizzly. If you Google something along the lines, hunting social media controversy, settle in for an infinitely wrong, long read because content related to that is being generated faster than you can read. Um, and there's no mentorship on the negative impacts of hunting social media. Uh, the nonprofits and the industry post dead and dying wildlife on social media every day. And so they're leading by example. They're not telling their recruits to not do it. So here's some quotes from the Humane Society and the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. I pulled this off their social media platforms and their websites. Uh, I'll just read one of these. Killing magnificent wild animals for fun and social media bragging is not only wrong, but a serious detriment to conservation. Hunting social media does nothing positive, I would argue, and it uh, energizes the anti-hunting crowd. And when you put dead and dying wildlife on the computer for strangers to see, if you don't care about the antis, you should look at what's going on in Australia right now. And, you know, you're not just risking your hunting, you're risking hunting for people like me that don't put anything on the computer. Another misleading tidbit is that the hunter, hunter population is shrinking. This is a narrative that's kind of declined in recent years. Maybe as a consequence of me writing an article in 2021 uh, where I point out that much of the evidence that the hunter population is shrinking is due to a potential statistical artifact. And then Andrew McKean in Outdoor Life, which is kind of funny because they're the ones that have written articles for many years about how we're losing hunters. All of a sudden, he comes out in, out in 2021 and says, we have no, many, uh, we have no idea how many hunters there are because of the idiosyncrasies and how the states measure that. In any case, the raw number of hunters, I would argue, is meaningless. What matters is hunters per huntable acre, and that is clearly in decline because of leasing and habitat loss. And what matters is an energized community of hunter advocates that fight for access, fight for habitat, Fight for our rights to hunt. And you know how you get that? By having them have quality hunting, okay? Um, it's not the number. It's how energized they are. 
and how energized they are has everything to do with the quality of the hunting. Um, there's also this idea that we need our three to increase diversity, equity, and inclusivity. And, and I do agree that hunting is predominantly a white male sport. There's more women getting into it now, some for legitimate reasons, some to become an influencer, some because they've figured out this content where they're like, appear sexually primed next to dead wildlife and fish is a, is a big hit with the fellas on Instagram. Um, <clears throat> so I would argue that if we really wanted to increase DEI, we would discourage hunting entertainment and social media, which jacks up the price of access and discourage leasing and privatization. You know, a little mentorship is great, but these are the 1,200 pound purple gorillas in the room. Uh, if you look at where underrepresented groups live uh, with Hispanics, Texas and California, everything's leased out there. So if you wanna bring in Hispanics, you gotta make some access. Look at the, look at the black population, the Southeast. Those are, that's like, you could have that map be instead of the colors representing percent black, have it be percent least and it almost looked the same. That's the challenge. The hunting nonprofits encourage privatization. So, so much for DEI. You can find all kinds of articles, uh, finding a quality hunting lease. This is the National Deer Association, who are also a, a proud sponsor of the hunting lease network. Sometimes you gotta pay to play, Amer American T Turkey Federation and on and on. So, um, ever, like I say, everything in the hunting sphere is pushing towards pay to play. Of course, anything that the nonprofits do, the hunting industry does in spades because, I mean, the nonprofits are really just the handmaiden to the hunting industry. So, here's some other articles from uh, hunting industry. Another example is Blood Origins. I don't know if you guys know about this little nonprofit, but they now, inter, they now advertise for uh, Land Trust. Land Trust is a private land lease company. So they hook up large landowners um, with people that want to hunt their land. It's a uh, outfit that's in direct competition with government programs that allow everybody to hunt like the block management program in Montana and many, many other states that have similar programs. This article that I cite on the bottom profiles a 50,000 acre ranch that this outfit just enticed out of black block management and into this pay to play deal. There's many others in addition to Blood Origins, Knock on Archery advertises for them now so much for knocking on doors. They've just gotten huge influx of cash from the Wilkes brothers. I can't imagine two people that care less about public access than them. And the, the Canadian businessman, Kevin O'Leary from Shark, of Shark Tank, Tank fame has infused a bunch of cash into this outfit too. Hunting entertainment clearly facilitates privatization, I would argue. Uh, I, I've been saying for the last couple of years that hunting TV and social media are free advertising for landowners, lease companies, and private land outfitters. I live in Eastern Montana. My friends' dads tell me that in the 80s they could hunt all that ranch land around there. And now it's like actually, access has gone to hell. And this has all happened over since the 80s. It, the access started to decline with the advent of cable hunting TV. And then it really started to tank with the advent of hunting social media about 10, 12 years ago. I've had several guests on my podcast and people that have emailed me that said they've got into hunting and leased up land directly as a byproduct of hunting media. They've gone with leased land outfitters directly as a consequence of hunting media. But I don't even have to rely on all these anecdotes. Here's a TV show where they show you attractive hunting content and then try to sell you hunting property at the end, okay? It's pretty, that's pretty explicit, 
of what I'm saying, that hunting media drives privatization. Here's another example of, of a show that does this, the same thing. These guys, this, this Whitetail Properties Outdoor Channel, it's also Whitetail Properties, the company who are in collaboration with Sika Gear. Uh, here's a quote from their website. Today, Whitetail Properties has over 300 land specialists covering 38 states and counting. To date, the company's team has sold over 1.3 million acres of hunting, ranch, and farmland. And I want to draw attention there because these are working lands. Or maybe you could have, maybe at one point you could have banged on the door. Or maybe they would have been enrolled in a program that allows everybody to hunt. Uh, but the industry can't have that. So they work towards trying to subdivide it and sell it for as exclusive access. Wild, whitetail properties averages over 10 properties sold every day company-wide. Well, the hunting industry owns, markets, and leases land. Lots of it. Uh, and this is nowhere near a complete list. I'm not an industry insider. This is just what I could gather. So I can't imagine a bigger be betrayal of their fiduciary responsibility to the sportsmen. They take the money that we give them for products and then make it so that we have fewer dot places to use those products. I think that that is a problem. So here's a, some quotes from the, the Realtree website. We have to keep introducing people to hunting. The more we have among our ranks, the better our future looks. And then elsewhere on the same website, if you are ready to get away from the crowd, call today for more information or to schedule a showing. So it's like this company has split personality disorder. On one hand, they're increasing crowding, and then they're trying to sell you property so you can get away from it. Uh, here's a, a mossy oak. The importance of recruiting new active hunters can't be overstated. So this is uh, from their website, and then they, they, there's this Mossy Oak Properties advertisement. They market a lot of land. With each season comes larger crowds sharing national forests and grasslands. With your own private hunting land in your own backyard sharing the backdrop of Colorado's Rocky Mountains, you can't miss. Mossy Oak Properties know how important it is to get your hunt on with, without all the crowds. So... I would argue that the people that sell the clothes, which are top line there, and the people that sell the property ought to probably get together and see if they can come up with a unified message because these statements are completely contradictory. Another recent example is Eric Siegfried of Onyx uh, in, in collaboration with Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. Onyx has been profiling landlocked public land Throughout the U.S., Western U.S., they got a report where they quantify it. Then they have film projects where they fly into it and show the American people all the landlocked land that they own that they can't see. In this video on broken country, Eric says, I want my great, 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 great grandchildren to look back on this time in history and realize we did great work for public lands. So you wouldn't guess that two years ago, Eric bought Cottonwood Outfitters and is outfitting what? About 16,500 acres of landlocked public land. <clears throat> A little more on hunting TV and social media. This is the flow day at diagram. I, I used to think through what hunting TV and hunting social media do. The ability to display dead and dying wildlife to strangers it turns hunting into a popularity contest. It creates a market for dead and dying wildlife content. It leads to poaching and hoarding of, of hunting opportunity, which leads to bad role models and compromised integrity. So I'm gonna show you some information to support uh, this flow diagram. So these are hunting TV personalities and social media Influencers that have caught, gotten caught poaching since 2010, and this is nowhere near a complete list. And I can't imagine how many haven't got caught. I often say that I could poach for the rest of my life quite easily without getting caught. You have to kind of be an idiot to get caught. So you can, you can imagine how many of these guys are out there that haven't got caught. And what's causing this? 
they're under a tremendous amount of pressure to generate carcasses. So they have to resort to a, 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 a legal means to get sufficient amount of content. Uh, there's a lot, here's a little more on killing for content. Uh, these, are, these are some of the top influencers um, and this is what they killed in 2022 out of decorum. I left their names out. We, my little group had a long discussion about, about whether I should do that or not, but we decided to for purposes of, of this talk. We don't always leave the names out on our social media. Um, so this first person here, they killed four whitetail, two mule deer, two moose, four elk, one pronghorn, one black bear, all in calendar year 22. Um, influencer five, look at that. Like, what is that, 21 to 26 big game animals? Uh, I, I have so much to say about this that I had to devote a slide to my points because I didn't want to forget any of them. This is what's being modeled as success, which I think is a huge problem. Um, I would argue that at most one elk, one elk deer and pronghorn per family it, per year is, is plenty. Um, and, it, and if it's not, maybe you should learn how to bake a potato or make a salad. Even if all this meat is given away, nobody appreciates game meat more than the people that are willing to go out, care enough about it to go out and get it. I give them a little game meat away once in a while. Don't don't make, turn this into like I'm opposed to all giving away of game meat. I give a little bit, but I give it away under contract. I say in a year, if this isn't gone, I'm coming to your house and I'm getting it. And I have gotten it. So I, I, I don't think the people that you give it to, you know, you can't count, necessarily count on them to actually use it. I think it's much more cherished by people that are willing to go out and get it. So that argument falls flat on its face. Like we gave it away, so it doesn't matter. It, it, another point is that, so the average number of elk killed on that last slide is three. And if everybody that had an, had, had an elk tag last year killed three elk, elk would be extinct. There'd be negative two million elk. Uh, about 15% of elk hunters are successful each year. I'm argue, I would argue that if you're killing three, it's not because you're a better hunter, okay, first of all. It's because you got cherry hookups and maybe you should be trying to find ways to help these people that are struggling on public land. All these influencers that were listed on the last slide uh, market a lot of how, how to content. I mean, I would, I think that if you have an instructor, you want to have an instructor that truly cares about your success and when you're hoarding that much hunting opportunity for yourself, it seems like the content is pretty ins insincere. Um, I don't think that these folks really care much about the future of hunting. According to National Shooting Sports Foundation poll, 84% of Americans approve of hunting for meat, whereas only 29 approve of, of trophy hunting. So, you know, you could kill that many animals and keep them off the computer if you wanted, but no, they all got to go on social media. So. These people don't care about the future of hunting. They don't care about doing things that's, that's controversial. They don't care about compromising my future rights to hunt as somebody that doesn't put anything on the computer. They put it all on the computer, even though the polling data is quite clear that Americans are not on board with trophy hunting. So why are you hearing this from me and no one else? Um, it's because the hunting nonprofits, the hunting celebrities, the hunting industry, because of the way the money flows, they can take no tough stances on anything. Okay? Let's say that the nonprofits wanted to uh, call out Onyx for their hypocrisy. Well, that ain't going to fly um, because Onyx donates to the nonprofits. Let's say that the Hunting nonprofits wanted to lobby for laws that would make it so that every that people in the US, hunters in the U.S. could only harvest one elk a year. That seems reasonable to me. They want more hunters. Shouldn't we share the wealth? Well, that ain't going to fly because the hunting industry 
makes a lot of money off these gluttons that kill three or four of them a year. Okay, so that ain't going to work. Um, let's say a hunting celebrity develops a conscience. I know it's a stretch, but let's just say for a minute that they did. And they want to, they come out against uh, leasing in a sta in states that have programs that allow everybody to hunt on private land. Well, that ain't going to fly because the outfitter associations lease a lot of land and they're business partners with the hunting industry. So that's not going to work. Or let's say the hunting celebrity started saying vociferously, consistently, we have a problem with too many hunters and I think we need to move away from R3. Well, that guy's going to run into all kinds of problems with the hunting nonprofits and the hunting industry. He might even have to go back to his day job as a ski lift operator. Um, but there's one layer, one tier beneath this that's driving the whole thing, and that's us, the hunters, right? And that's the only thing that gives me any hope. And I don't have a lot of hope, but it gives me a little. Um, if we started to direct our eyeballs and our expenditures and our time in ways that align with our values, some of this could change. So I'm gonna move on to a few prescriptions. I'd say the most important thing you could do is dispense with the dogma that people that make, off, that make money off hunting have filled you with and think for yourself, okay? And that goes for me too. I don't make money off hunting, I lose money off hunting. I lose money through my hunting advocacy. I'm probably four or five grand into this thing now. Um, but that includes me, okay? So don't take anything I'm saying at face value either. Think about it for yourself. That's a high level first step, I think. Um, and look out for your fellow hunters, you know? Why can't we just be, a, why can't we work at being a family? where we look out for each other, where we don't gobble up all kinds of property and opportunity for ourselves without thinking about other, other folks. Don't display or follow hunters that display dead and dying animals to strangers on social media. That's probably abundantly clear that I think that by now. Don't watch hunting TV because if you stop, it'll go away. Uh, leasing and buying hunting land is an absolute last resort if you do it. Share it liberally with as many people as possible. Don't donate to nonprofits. I'm sorry, including this one. That do recruitment, retention, and reactivation. Let the hunting industry fund these nonprofits. That's their stakeholder group anyway. Um, instead, here's some nonprofits that you can think about supporting. The Nature, Nature Conservancy does a lot of good stuff for conservation and access. Uh, Howl for Wildlife, this is a nonprofit that makes voters aware of bills that net could negatively affect their um, right to hunt. For Progeny, this is a young guy in Texas that's trying to crowdsource funding for to buy properties that can be turned it over for public hunting. Um, Hunters for Non, Hunters for Access, I'm a co-founder of this nonprofit, the our president, John Coots, who traveled down here with me today, he's the president. But what we do is we raise money. John raised $8,000 this year in a little tiny town of Miles City, Montana, where I live, with 9,000 people. And we take that money and we buy appreciation gifts, calf shelters, gift certificates to home and ranch supply stores, post pounders, et cetera, et cetera. And we give it away to farmers and ranchers that are enrolled in our block management program, which is our flagship program that allows public access on private land. Um, so uh, that's one thing we do. Another thing we do is that we orchestrate work days. We've been doing this informally, but we're doing it more formally now. We've got a website that's listed here and you can go there and sign up. You can give a donation or you can sign up to do a work day on one of these block management properties this summer. Come out and, you know, fix some fence or un unclog some piv pivot nozzles for a day. The hope is that 
a little bit of appreciation uh, kind of counterbalances the bad behavior that some hunters engage in when they're hunting on these places and encourages people, uh, landowners, to stay in these programs and make sure that the local guy at the hardware store or the gas station has some place to go. Or, you know, you could just, uh, oh, hey, one other thing I want to say about this. It appears to me that this is going national already. Uh, for example, Kansas, a guy in Kansas that I've been talking to on the phone, he's already started his own 501c3 there. He's going to be using our website. We're elaborating our website to allow the people to sign up for other states. Um, and he's already got his board put together, so it looks like he's moving forward. And I have several podcast episodes coming up with other, hunters from other states and their agency personnel that oversee these little programs, access programs from around the country to see if we can try to build some momentum for that. Or you just think a landowner that, one of the few landowners anymore that a lot just allows, allows uh, access, bring them a pie or a bottle of whiskey or go help him brand or something. You could buy from companies that limit R3 hunting TV Influ and influencer advertising. We're actively engaged in trying to find these little companies. Hunting Exchange isn't a, isn't, they don't manufacture anything. That's, they, but they sell a lot of used, high quality used hunting uh, products. TNK Hunting Gear, gear that's, TNK Hunting Gear is a little uh, veteran owned company in South Dakota. And then some other companies that, aren't feeding into the hype. So these are some companies that we support and we're trying to find more. We've been doing a little bit of this lately, this kind of thing lately. Uh, it takes a lot of research. So we're just trying to do it the best we can over time. This is comparing a company, Sitka, that we don't like to one, uh, to Gulch Gear. Gulch Gear is owned and operated by, he was a, he was a, a, a Pixar animator in a former life and now he has a camo company. Um, so we compare them, these companies, according to several metrics. They both have limited lifetime warranties. Uh, Sika manufa manufactures abroad, mostly in China, I think. Um, whereas Gulch Gear is manufactured domestically. The prices on their products are similar, uh, but Sika supports nonprofits that do R3 where Gold's Gear does not. Uh, they, SICK also sp sponsors lots of celebrities and advertises on hunting TV, including whitetail properties. And then as near as we can tell, uh, there's been over 300,000 animals used, dead animals used as advertising instruments by Sitka, where the number is under 100 for Gold's Gear. So, Go gold gear. You could consider supporting the Hunt Quietly movement. You can't give us any money because we don't take any. Um, but you could buy an at-cost hat, t-shirt, or bumper sticker at huntquietly.org. Or you could just make your own. I don't give a shit because I'm not making any money off of them. Um, you could sign on to create content for us, videos, photos, illustrations, maybe write blog posts and articles. You could help us with this research we're doing into companies and issues. You could help us moderate our social media, web design. You could help us find podcast guests or be a podcast guest. And perhaps most importantly of all, you could come up with ideas that we never even thought of. So, uh, here's our platforms. We got the Hunt Quietly podcast. We have a little Reddit account that one of our folks, is, two of our folks are moderating a bit, our Instagram page and our website. And I thought I would leave you with a plug of my new favorite television show, Hunt Wars. So you put in the draw, and if your team gets drawn, and you survive the interview process where they make sure you're enough of a badass, then you get to go on a hunt and use all these gear spot, all these sponsors gear and many more. A fact that the cameraman 
never let you forget. And whoever shoots the biggest, oldest one gets thousands of dollars in cash and prizes. So tune in. Thanks.